I'm longing for her garden. Who can't once walk with me here? I'm longing for today We'll never be apart Every tear Where every tear Will be wiped away Be no sorrow, hurt, or pain There'll be no more night All things will be made new It'll be a brand Till that day I'm longing for the new Jerusalem And I looked and saw the city Descending down from heaven Prepared just like a bride And for the son of me here And there's a day of blood Written on his heart And he's longing for the day we will never be apart. Every tear here will be wiped away. Be no sorrow, hurt, or pain. There'll be no more night. All things will be made new. It'll be a brand new day. And in righteousness, there'll be. 
here The King is here You're alive inside of me The King is here The King is here Love will never, ever leave We worship and we pray We worship and we pray
room. Do not leave my sanctuary without coming and spending time with me because I am here to grant your requests. I am here to change you. I am here to bring you deliverance and freedom. I am here to meet your needs. I am here to hold my arms out so that you can come and climb in my lap and I can be daddy God for you. I am here to be who you need in this hour. I am here for you and my scepter is reached out to you. This is not a light thing. This is not a light thing if you do not come now. The blessing that I have for you today will not be offered again today. It's not like you can go home. My offer is for this morning in this sanctuary. Do not leave without coming to me this morning. It may not be light, but it is given in love. I love you, and I want to meet your needs. <laughs> I love you. Please, please, please respond to my invitation. Please respond to my invitation because I love you and want to meet your needs. <laughs> Come to me.
be home You can have your car Right after the prayer conference, I passed out a, a prayer calendar that was a tool that could be used to look at the characteristic of God. And on the 12th, God is holy came up. And it has been in my spirit ever since and growing. I couldn't get away from this definition. God is holy. God's holiness is not simply our best image of perfection. God is utterly and supremely untainted. His holiness stands apart, unique and incomprehensible. Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, show us heaven. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him, who live forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. What a picture. You've, many of you have thought of it before, but at the declaration of God being holy, the 24 elders fall down. That is significant. They didn't bow down. Bowing down is a calculated act of our will to show reverence and honor to God. We should bow down. But it said they fell down, and the picture that we have of that is that with the declaration of the name holy, they are hit with something that puts them on their face. They have no control. They are affected by the mere declaration, holy. For it is a name that is only used for God and for His true people. Holy. No other creation is given that name. Holy, holy, holy. Wave after wave of His holiness hits them. It was happening when John saw the revelation of Jesus and it's happening right now in heaven. Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And as you continue with their prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It obviously is the will of God that at the declaration of his name, 
the effect of who he is would hit his creation in such a way that it would bring a fresh new revelation of who he is. Holiness. What is it about his holiness that causes that effect? Well, it's in the definition of his name. Holy. God is holy. God's holiness is not simply the best image of perfection. God is utterly, supremely untainted. His holiness stands apart, unique, and incomprehensible. His holiness is untainted. His holiness is untaintable. And yes, that's a word. Well, I don't know if it is or not. I'm just... <laughs> His love, untainted. His mercy, untainted. Get that in your spirit. His grace, untainted. His patience, untainted. His long-suffering, untainted. His kindness, untainted. His goodness, untainted. His gentleness, untainted. No matter what we do, and what we don't do. Our actions and or inactions do not affect who He is. He is holy. Certainly we can leave a mark on His heart. But that doesn't change His response to us. We might leave Him broken hearted. But His love remains untainted. We might disappoint Him and bring tears to his eyes, but his, his grace is untainted. We might even take him for granted, yet his patience is untainted. We might treat him rudely, unkindly. We might ignore him. We might, by our actions and our words, kick him to the curb, yet his kindness, his goodness, his mercy, his forgiveness is untainted. Let that get in your spirit. He might get angry with us. Yet he's untainted. He is holy. And his holiness is why nothing we can do affects his love. And love is his primary motive to all that he does. If you question why He still loves you after all that you've done and continue to do, it's because He's holy. He's untainted. The answer to why God continues to be who He is, why does He still have mercy on me, you ask? Because He's holy. Why does He keep forgiving me? Because he's untainted. Why, does he, why doesn't he just give up on me after I've given up my, on myself? It's because he's untainted. Why does he keep going after the people that have hurt me so bad? It's because he's untainted by what people have done to him and by what people have done to you. And if that's a problem with you, you better get over it. There are people in this room that are holding things against God because God's unmerited favor, grace, love, mercy, and all is still being poured out to the people that have run you over again and again and again. And you're holding that against God. But even your bitterness and your unforgiveness doesn't taint Him. He's waiting patiently for you to break in his presence. Why does he still hold? Here's a question. Maybe you never ask it. Why does he still want me? Why? Because he's untainted. And why does he still hold us to his high standard? Because he's untainted. Our actions do not taint who he is or his view about us because he is holy. Let that sink in. 
Paul said, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither does death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, nor even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. For no power in sky above or in earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can anybody say, wow? I'm telling you. Does that mean that we can do anything we want to do and still be right with God? No. Why should you say then, shall we continue in sin and grace may abound? Certainly not. Now shall we who die to sin live any longer in it. The old King James puts it this way. God forbid. Oh, that's good terminology. God forbid that you and I would play with sin, but we do. I'm not pointing at you, I'm pointing at us. Why? Why do we keep leaning on our own understanding? Why do we come to an altar and ask God for things to, to change in our lives? And we mean it at the moment, but we walk out. And here's a probability. Here, no, let me, I don't want to say a probability. I don't want to speak any death. But here's a pattern that some of you have been in. You come to the altar. You, you, you with all your heart really mean it, you want to get right with God and you want that stuff in your past to be passed only to go home and maybe even that same day getting a knockdown drag out with your spouse. Why? Because you're tainted. Does it mean you didn't mean it when you ask Him to forgive you? No. But what it does mean is we haven't gone deep enough we only want God to do a surface cleansing, but God wants to do a deep cleansing. And some people don't want a deep cleansing because it means they have to change and can no longer point their finger at the person who did or didn't. Aren't you glad that God doesn't point any fingers? If He points a finger at all, He points to the cross. And He said, I took care of it there. Wow. Why is it that we tend to do that? Well, I'm going to name a, a major sin. It's the sin of familiarity. It happens, it can so happen in any relationship. It's not intended. When you stood before your spouse or you made vows to your friends, I'm always going to be there for you. You entered into a covenant or marriage, whatever. You entered into those relationships, never intending. And, and guard your heart from thinking that the other person had an ulterior motive and they lied to you. Because to believe that their motives were wrong at the time means you're tainted. But nobody intended that. You would drift apart and become bickering, distant, separated, you name the word. Some of you, I'm reading your mail right now, and you don't want me to. But I'm telling you, you're tainted. It's not intended. But you know what happens not only in our best of earthly relationships, in our relationship with our Heavenly Father, we become tainted in our perspective of who He is. Now, you're not going to like this because I don't like it either, and I don't even want to say it because it's true to me. But the moment my view of God becomes tainted, and the moment my view of others becomes tainted, it means that I value my own opinion more than I do anybody else, and more than I value God, and can I just put it out there for where it is? The moment you value your opinion more than someone else, you think you're better than them. You think you're superior to them. You're not superior to anybody. I'm not superior to anybody. Listen to this warning. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. 
You're not better than anybody else. You're not. I'm not. You and I are not superior to anyone. And when we choose our way of doing things over what the Bible says, then we think we're superior to God. Am I right? Okay, you're getting a little quiet on me, friends. If you've sought his forgiveness and you're striving to live a life of repentance, then you've been clean. You've been cleansed. Stay cleansed. You've been made holy through his blood. Stay holy. You've set out on a path up the mountain of God to seek the Lord. Stay on the path. Consider these verses. Consecrate yourself, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Peter again said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into marvelous light, who once was not a people but are now the people of God, who has not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Hallelujah. So this begs the question, how can I possibly be holy? Because if you've been serving God for any length of time, you've wanted to live a righteous and holy life, but you have failed. Am I right? I have two. I'm not pointing a finger. How can we possibly be holy? Well, there's an answer, but before I give you that answer, I want to take a look at consecration for a moment. Consecration, living it out. Consecrate yourself there before, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy, your God. To consecrate means to sanctify, to prepare, to dedicate. To set oneself apart on a pilgrimage, on a path. The picture here is one who is on a journey. And this journey is full of obstacles that will attempt to keep you from staying on the path. But it's not only full of obstacles, things that want to get in your way. It is full of some really good things. Desires and even good alternatives. To the long, difficult course that you chose. It is not always, and I would say for many Christ followers, it is not necessarily even a a big sin looming out there that's trying to tempt you, though we do deal with those things. But oftentimes it's good things. And the good things that potentially are keeping us from pursuing God in holiness are people that we love and we care about. (laughs) We have to say no to people we love and care about in order to pursue God who calls you to holiness. Look what Jesus said in Luke 14, 26 and 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciples. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. Hate. Hate's a strong word. Hate is used here because there is no equivalent in the English language to the intent of the Greek word that has been translated hate. And by no means am I implying that I think it's an incorrect word. In context, we need to understand it. We must love less. We must love 
the closest ones to us less. But that's not enough. It, it, it really implies we have to even slight those that we hold dear in this life in order to pursue God. We've got to say no to them. Now don't let that rise you up in some way where now you're gonna, you think you're better and oh, I won't let you take me. No, you can't. No one can taint you. Let me, hear, let, me, let me tell you that. No one can taint you. If you're tainted, it's because you chose it. Now, I'm going to make this easier in a minute, but boy, Pastor Linda gave that, that word this morning. Was that spot on in setting the stage? She had no idea what I was preaching. So if you don't like this, blame her, okay? <laughs> tainted. Okay, shut up. <laughs> Levity. Wow. God's love must trump all other love. But that doesn't put enough emphasis on it. We live in a day of relativity. We live in a day where Christians have adopted the lie that had set this whole sin thing in motion when Satan asked Eve and and planted a seed. Did God really mean that? Yeah, God really meant it. God really meant it. So it's Sunday morning, and mom or grandma want everybody to come to the house for brunch at 1030. What do you do? It's little Junior's birthday party. It's Aunt Sally's whatever. What do you do? Go to church? Because Scripture says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? Or do you justify? He didn't really mean that. Your choice shows who you esteem most in that moment. Your co-workers are complaining about the boss or the company. And you too have some legitimate complaints. Do you join in and complain with the co-workers? Or do you only take your concerns to your boss about issues you might have with him or her or the company? Your choice shows who you love more. God who would see you joining in with the complaining of your co-workers as gossip. By the way, one of the seven deadly sins. Or God. You are easily irritated with your spouse because he or she does not satisfy your expectations. They haven't done what they said they were going to do. Therefore, to you, the issue isn't resolved and it flares up. And how do we know it flares up? Because that button is there and that thing is raw. And you can go from zero to a hundred in a split second. From calm and God is good to... It's unresolved. Do you talk it through and pray it through? Do you realize that it's your issue and not his or hers? And forgive? Or do you let it fester? Your choice shows whether or not You love your own opinion more than the opinion of God who said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. If you and I are consecrated to God and His holiness, then everything is filtered through His Word. And there is no place for excuse of saying, well, I don't know what it means. Because Scripture says, study to show yourself approved. A workman needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I don't have an excuse to say, well, I didn't know that or I didn't read that. All that is saying is if I choose not to study the Word, and you say, well, you're a pastor. It has nothing to do with it. If God stripped me of my ministry today, it wouldn't change the fact that I need to study the show myself or proof. Not study to preach a message to you. Not study to do a Bible study. But because I'm a man of God, because I've set my heart on a pilgrimage to pursue God, then I must study and I have no excuse. So back to the answer, how can I possibly be holy? 
The answer is live by God's opinion of you, not your own and not others. Let me develop that. The reasons you and I don't do what we can and should, those reasons are nothing more than excuses. Can we just get that in our heads and in our hearts? If only he would do this. If only I... It doesn't matter. If that hadn't happened. I, remember God's untainted, so as long as you're unleashing and all that stuff's going on, he's just patiently waiting. They'll get tired of that someday. Maybe. No, he knows, right? He'll wait you out. He, can, he plays stare down than, better than anybody. Your physical, mental, or emotional issues might be real, and they might make it difficult for you. It might be a challenge for you because there are some real things in your life, but all that does is make it harder. It doesn't make it impossible because you throw, you, you throw up how much harder it is than others. And before you do that, well, it's harder for me than that one. I want to ask you this question. How do you know how hard it is to someone else? And are you equal to Jesus? Because last I looked, He's the only one who really knows. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. You're not in their heads, you're not in their hearts, you don't know their struggles. But I want you to grab a hold of what this says about our high priest Jesus, who is tempted in every way like we are. That means he had to deal with the desire just like you do. It doesn't matter what that desire was. We don't like to think about Jesus this way. But if he's tempted just like we are as men or women, then that means he's tempted to allow anger to move into sin just like you are. He's tempted to let his mind go to sexually deviant places just like you are. He wants to self-gratify. He's, he wanted to self-gratify as much as you did. Do you get that? Yet without sin. Why? Because he was consecrated. And he focused on who Father God said he was. Now let me help you with this. Yes, Jesus, Jesus we know from the beginning was God. But when he became a babe in the manger, when he, when he screamed out, he, you know, we were talking about the other day, uh, the way in the manger really is a lie. Jesus cried. Straw was scratchy to his little skin too. But here's the reality, friend. Because he saw himself as the Son of God. Every man in the room, raise your hand. The Bible says you are destined to be the Son of God. Not the big D or H, but Son of God. Ladies, do you see your husband as the Son of God? Then you got a problem. This is not light. You're tainted. Men, do you see your wife as the beloved? Do you see her as a daughter of Zion? Do you realize her daddy is daddy God? Are you really going to treat her the way you do and think daddy God's going to let you get away with that? I have some restraints that keep me from getting a gun and shooting my sons-in-laws if they don't treat my daughters right. But, mister, God can take you out. And who's going to stop him? And who's going to say he's unjust? Because he just decided to say, let the wages of your sin have its way instead of letting the blood block it. Hmm. 
So you and I might have real physical, emotional, mental, experiential issues that make it really hard for us to be holy, but don't, so does everyone else, and there's no excuse that holds, no excuse that holds up to this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the only opinion or label that matters is God's. And if you're a true Christ follower and you're doing your best to follow Jesus, then this is what he says about you. You are a child of God, John chapter 1, verse 12. You are a friend of God, John 15, 15. The Bible says of you and his opinion of you, there is no condemnation of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And you are an heir of Christ, Romans 8, 17. And you have wisdom and righteousness and redemption in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. You are a new creation. creation. Get that in your spirit. You don't have to be that person. You don't have to believe that label. But I always, and I have, and it's up to this day. I don't care if this morning you came in and you're just full of all kinds of ugly. All you have to do is say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. And He washes you white as snow and the ugly is gone. What are you going to believe? The experiences of the past are the reality of God. Wow. The righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. That's what it says of you. You have been set free. That's what Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 is. If you and I are true Christ followers, then we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Ephesians 1, 3. If only. If I had this, if I had that. Ephesians 1, 3 says you have it. You've been given all spiritual blessings. You are chosen. You are holy. You are blameless before God. Ephesians 1.4 You are redeemed and forgiven by grace. Ephesians 1.7 You are seated in heavenly places with Christ. Ephesians 2.10 What have you seen from that lofty vantage point this morning? Mm -mm -mm. You have been brought near to God by the blood of Jesus, Ephesians 2.13. You are a member of Christ's body and partaker of His promise, Ephesians 3.6. You have a boldness and a confidence to access God through faith, Ephesians 3.12. You can come boldly before the throne of grace if you believe who you are in Christ Jesus, that you don't have any selfish motives, that you don't have any revenge, you don't have any, I'm going to show them, your whole heart is God, I just want you and more of you, and my life is for you. We can come boldly. And he's liable to say, I want you to do this and do that. And we're going to say, thank you for giving me something to do because my words feel inadequate. I want to do something for you, God. You have been made, Colossians 2.10, let this sink in, beloved. You've been made complete in Christ. Complete. What do you believe? Whose report do you believe? Your past because you have deliberately chosen not to go beyond where you are? Or what Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> you know, I want to give you a thought about walking through the fire. We think of the fire as always being something bad. Right? I mean, that's our tendency. When we, I don't know about you, but when I quote that scripture, I'll walk through the fire and I'll not be burned. <clears throat> but let me remind you, he is an all-consuming fire. Will you walk through that fire? Will you say, God, take me through the fire and burn off all the chaff and burn off all the debris and burn everything away? Help me to walk through that fire and He will be that fourth man in that fiery furnace. Hallelujah. And when you come out, it will be to the glory of God. Whether anybody else sees it or not, it doesn't matter. Because now your perspective has changed. Will you walk? Oh man, this is good. 
You have been chosen by God, holy and dearly loved, Colossians 3.12. You're an overcomer in Christ Jesus, 1 John 5.4. You're a citizen of heaven, Philippians 3.12. And I could go on and on, but I'll give you one more. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Philippians 4.13. That's right, Charles. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Not about me. It's about him. So how can I possibly be holy by living under and to and through who he says I am? One more thing. God in his holiness is untainted by choice. I want that to get into your heart too. You see, we look at ourselves and there's certain realities about us that there's just nothing I can change. I can't change certain realities about who I am. And we might look at God and say, well, God is incapable of being tainted. Oh, He is capable of being tainted. He chooses not to be tainted. Let me help you with that. I want you to consider the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Genesis 1.26 says that they all decided, let us make God in our own image, in our own likeness. That was a, 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 a Trinitarian decision, right? They all said it, let us. But we know that the Trinity, according to Genesis 6.6, 6, that the Trinity, under the auspices of just the title Lord, regretted that they ever made man. That's what it says in, 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 in the um, NSV and the NIV, it says, the Lord regretted. In the New King James, the living, uh, New Living, and the message says, God was sorry he made man. Aren't you feeling good about yourself? <laughs> he regrets you. Anderson, he's sorry. No. <laughs> no, I guess it would be Anderson, sorry. God, no, anyway, we'll leave that. King James says the Lord repented that he ever made man. Now let that get into your heart. Yet, untainted. We're talking about deep waters. We're talking about deep, deep stuff. But God made a choice to love us. God made a choice. Instead of wiping us out, which he could have, he chose to send Jesus in our stead. Now let's look at Jesus for just a moment on how he chose to be untainted. Jesus made the choice with Father and Holy Spirit at the beginning, whenever that was, in the beginning, let us make man in our own likeness and in our own image. Jesus was part of that decision process. In that decision process, in the, in, in, in the omniscience of God, they knew collectively that in making man in their own image, man would sin. And they made in that... See, it wasn't a blind decision. Let's make man in our own image. And then all of a sudden, man screws up and begins to sin. And it's like, oh man, let's huddle. we got to figure this out. What are we going to do? Had it all figured out. You see, the weight of the decision to be who He is to us was made at the beginning. Let us make man in our own image. Jesus was a part of that. And Jesus then also was a part of that when they're saying, okay, man's going to sin. And they figured it all out before it happened. Father said, the only re redemptive ability I have is to send you to die. And Jesus made in that decision, I will go and die. I will give up all the splendor of heaven. I will give up my divinity and I will become a man so I can be the first fruit among many brethren and show the way to be holy. And the Holy Spirit said, all right, I'll take upon myself 
to work in the hearts and the minds of everyone and convey the Father's heart to every human being. That was a big choice for Holy Spirit, too. Now let's look at Jesus. So he made that decision then. And once he became man, how many times did he have to struggle with not giving up on the whole save the world plan? I want you to think about that. Because he came into this world with a call upon his life. He came with a purpose. He came to destroy the works of the devil. You know where I'm going, don't you? You're supposed to destroy the works of the devil too. He's given you a purpose too. You don't have to die on the cross of Calvary for the sins of the world, but you do have to pick up your cross and follow Him for His sake and for the sake of others. Jesus, Jesus knew. We, we, we know He questioned how long. We know in Matthew and Mark and Luke, He came to a place when He was just exasperated with the disciples and, he, and we hear it coming out in His voice and I think if we listen carefully, we, we hear there's a little bit of an edge. He, wasn't, he didn't ever enter into sin, but I think He was angry, He was frustrated, He was hurt. It was all of that flowing together. How long do I have to be with you before you'll get it? And yet somehow, in the midst of all that, he never crossed that line. And he reined it back in. And then we know perhaps the most famous time right when that happened, when he said, not my will but yours be done. Don't you think he ever got tired of straightening things out that he had nothing to do with but because his disciples made so many bad choices? You think it really, you know, you think Jesus was really three, thrilled? Uh, you know, he's being arrested. It's like his darkest hour. Peter gets impetuous, lobs off the ear of the, of the, of the soldier. And you don't think Jesus wanted to stop there and say, Here, let me put that ear back on and heal you. Do you think he wanted to still be giving of himself? when he was tempted just like you and are, I are to be selfish and go, I don't want this, I don't like that, it's not fair. Why could he do that? Because he consecrated himself unto the Lord. Because the same challenge of Leviticus was his, be ye holy for I am holy. It's safe to say that he was continually tempted to say, forget it, all through his life journey, and he would have been justified. I'm not doing this anymore. Just let them live with the decisions they made. He could have changed his mind altogether. Or he could have stopped at any given moment, just for that moment. Not give up on the whole save the world thing, but for crying out loud, Peter, dude, zap! (laughs) And we all would have gone, yeah. (laughs) Right? So as much as he wanted to zap, he didn't zap. Honey, listen to me. As much as you want to zap your husband and you wish he wasn't in your life, you better get a handle on it. And sir, you better start treating her like the bride of Christ. Why am I coming down like this? Because you can't go into 2018 and be used of God for his glory and keep all that garbage inside of you and just put a sugar coating on it and come up to this altar in a little bit and whitewash that thing because the first time the rain comes, it's going to be washed away. And you're going to be left with ugly stains tainted by the stuff that you chose to hold on to rather than say, God, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Jesus made a choice, and he continues to make a choice. After all, after all, wow. He could have changed his mind altogether for just a moment. He could have listened to the opinions of others. He could have put some weight to what the devil said to him when we know he was in the, in the wilderness, and we know that the fiery darts of the wicked one were firing against him all through his earthly ministry. 
He could have given up on his own desires, but he was committed to Father. And to Holy Spirit, he made a pledge. After all, we make our choices. <laughs> Letting us live with our choices would have been totally justified. And it would have been an appropriate response to our sin. It would have. We already have looked at Hebrews 4.15. We know he was tempted, meaning there was a desire. But he was consecrated, and his consecration won the day. He struggled with the same pulls that you and I have, those habitual things that potentially want to come against us. You know, if God the Father wouldn't take away from from, from Paul, the thorn in the flesh, the thing that was so hard for him to, stay, to break away from and, and in order to stay focused, you know that Jesus had to have a thorn in the flesh too. Why? Because the high priest touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and maybe only Paul had a thorn in the flesh, but I think we could all call that the habitual temptation, which sometimes becomes a habitual sin. Is his grace sufficient? Sure it is. Ultimately, we've talked about it at his biggest moment, not my will, but yours be done. So I think we can all agree that the attitude of not my will, but yours be done had been done countless times before the record of the garden prayer. One more thing about his choice to be untainted. Do you know he's still making that choice? Because Hebrews 7.25 says he lives to make intercession for us. Can I be transparent with you that sometimes it's hard for me to pray for some of you, especially when you do the same stupid again and again and again. And sometimes I want to say, God, just zap them. <laughs> My life would be easier. I don't want you to go to another church. I just want you to die. <laughs> Okay. Sharon, you ready to finish? <laughs> Is that too real? But what do I have to do? I haven't killed you, right? And I haven't called Guido. I do know Guido. But what have I had to do? Bruce, you can't think that way. And what have I had to do? God, not my will, but yours be done. I've had to allow the Father to change my heart so I can pray a blessing over you because I really do love you, but sometimes i got to work through the layers of stuff. Not my will. I don't know. God is pretty long-suffering, but I have read the book. And I do, yeah, more than once. <laughs> and I do know that for some, he draws a line. I, I, I'm not at all inflicting any kind of fear here of where that line is. He, you might be close to it. I'm not saying that, but it could be. I don't know. But I do know this. Until the Father turns you over to the devil for the destruction of your flesh and the salvation of your soul and says, all right, live with all. You see, here's the deal. Every one of us in this room, to a degree or another, have pulled away from our commitment to be holy, but God never pulled away from his covering and his protection. And even though there have been some consequences to your sins, even since you've been a Christ follower, by no means has the full weight of the consequences of your sins come your way. Why? Because there is a wall called the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And Jesus right now is praying. So you might say, how can he keep doing that? Because he prays through to be able to bless you. Will you pray through to be a blessing to others and stop making it about you? I'm sorry, I never intended to be that hard, but I hope you're here in love because that's what you're getting. Remember the definition of consecration to be dedicated, to, to be preparing and prepared. Like Jesus, our decision to follow him will be continually challenged, being tainted with our past as a choice, being tainted by the opinions of others and our own hearts that would fail us, our own opinions. It's a choice. After all, he said, be untainted as I am untainted. 
Now, this message, the focus of this message is not on the challenge of holiness, but rather the blessing of holiness. Let me give you something to take into the new year. How different would your life be if every opinion and every thought you had was and is utterly and supremely untainted, standing apart from this world and aligned with God? How different would your relationship with your husband be if you were untainted? How different would your relationship with your wife be if you were untainted? You see, it's never been about them. How different would my life be if I wasn't untainted, if I was untainted by the things that have happened to me? How different? How different would you be if you decided that everything that happened to you wouldn't leave you tainted? May our praise be untainted by our failure and our sin. May our prayers for ourselves be untainted by our selfish ambitions and desires. May our interaction with those we love <coughs> and care about be untainted. I'm not ready for you yet. It's Hamlet. Act 3, scene 1, and you're posed with the question, to be or not to be? To be or not to be holy, that is the question. By the way, Shakespeare didn't stay holy. <laughs> <laughs> you can choose to love your own opinion and or the opinions of others more than God and his opinion and stay tainted. Or you can choose to fight the good fight of faith, crucify the flesh, die to self, and follow him because you've set your heart on a pilgrimage. It's time to seek forgiveness from God. And it's time to be determined to seek forgiveness from others. And it's time to forgive others, untainted. Not a, Carol, would you forgive me because I held that against you. But man, if you hadn't done that, that's tainted. Because if I actually had something, we're good, right? <laughs> if we really had something, I just have to say, forgive me. I was wrong. Let me give you another tidbit there. Because I want you to enter into 2018 if Jesus tarries and, and, and we see midnight tonight. I want you to start a new year untainted. Going to someone and saying, now, oh, just hear my heart. I won't have to qualify everything that goes in there. But I just want you to, I just want you to deal with something here. Okay, I'm going to use my friend Ed, because we're good. He did the finger point last night to me, and it's all good. I love him. <laughs> I got untainted. <laughs> if I went to Ed and said, Ed, you're, I, I need you to forgive me because for the last five years I've been holding this against you, da 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 da, da and Ed's going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what? What did I do? I just dumped on him. It was never his to carry. He didn't even know it was there. Don't do that. Because the moment I do that, what am I doing? I'm transferring responsibility. I feel better about myself because I unloaded the garbage instead of forgiving him. And he probably didn't need to be forgiven anyway. I don't know about you, there have been times in my life where I've gone to the Lord and I've had to say, Lord, help me to forgive Neely. I don't know if I've had to do that or not, Neil. <laughs> I 
And God would come back and say, what did Neil do? Well, blah, 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 blah. Was that his intent? Well, I don't know, but that's what happened. No. You getting this? Between you and God. Now, if you know there's ought, if there's something your loved one, your friend, your spouse, your whoever's done, well, then deal with it. Get the elephant in the room. Don't throw it at them. Relieve them of it. Here's forgiveness. I'm not holding you accountable to it. I'm taking it from you. I do forgive you. And it's not, I'm all that in a bag of chips. Look at me, Mr. Spiritual. Remember, I'm not better than anybody else. Think, he warned us, don't think of yourself more highly. Why am I laboring here for just a moment? Because some of you really need to hear this. Be untainted means nobody knows. And if they do know, it's because they see the change in your countenance and your attitude and the way you live your life. And it's not, well, I did this. Because then that's all about you again, and that selfish taintedness starts all over. Father, I'm done. Father, you know how I've wrestled with this on really how we're supposed to go, so I'm asking you right now to settle over this place with your presence. You're already here. 